paper today, I'd better stand here myself, uh, and speakers please use the microphones here. The first paper today, um, or the, in this afternoon session, is Scott Hargraves from SDA Company, uh, he is a consultant, and he will be speaking about reaching citizens slash stakeholders, multimedia in the engagement strategies of Australian public sector organisations. So, welcome Scott. Thank you, Pat. Um, 
I will stick to the microphone, I promise. Um, perhaps this one, I actually need to load the presentation. Okay. We have a um, touch screen to activate. Yep. Oh, you've been here before. Excellent. Um, thanks for that, Daniel. Um, it's nice to be back. Uh, first time ever on this side of the podium. Uh, it's, it's nice to be back on campus at a conference hosted by the Department of Political and Science uh, and the Centre for Public Policy. I had, uh, in Many years ago, I took a degree from each, um, so it's a, it's sort of come back here the long way around. STA, uh, as Pat mentioned, is a consulting firm, so we're in the business of uh, communicating and engaging with uh, uh, with stakeholders and customers, including on behalf of uh, government agencies. Um, but it is relevant that uh, I did have that background uh, uh, or uh, undergraduate background uh, and postgraduate because it's the the public policy perspective has sort of stayed with me uh, through what I'm what I do on a day to day basis, uh, but. Uh, that was sometimes a frustrating experience. Uh, as we all know, the, uh, the more ideas you have, uh, the more they get beaten out of you as you actually try to engage in uh, real-world projects uh, which become very prosaic. And there wasn't uh, necessarily the, the rigorous approach uh, being applied to a lot of the projects that I was working on, and not a lot around. So uh, I finished up doing my own research, which is... and. How I came to be here was when I heard about the conference. I thought, well, at least uh, aspects of it are relevant to what uh, what this uh, conference is about, what this gathering is about, and in particular, uh, e-governance, uh, how how government relates, uh, and the, the business of government, the mechanics of government relate to uh, to stakeholders and and citizens, if you like. Uh, apart from anything else, the the research was focused on government departments and and statutory authorities, and I think that in itself is, is a useful reminder because um, whatever else uh, we might achieve at a theoretical level or even that uh, politicians uh, and funders of projects might get on board with, uh, when it comes to government, it's, it's usually organised around a, a government department or some kind of, of agency, so understanding how they behave and how they approach things uh, hopefully is, is of interest in, in its own right. Um, just briefly, so what I'll, what I'll be doing in this presentation is uh, drawing some parallels uh, between uh, what, what we do at STA on a day-to-day -day basis, which is mainly about communicating, but uh, draw, so I'll draw the parallel to that and, uh, and e-governance generally. Um, and then also, by doing that, put multimedia in the context of, uh, of other channels, of other tools that, that communicators use and that, that may become necessary uh, in an e-governance initiative. And uh, I'll come back to this later, but I think one of the lessons probably is that uh, uh, things do need to be, to be integrated to an extent. Uh, in uh, communications theory, such, such as it is, uh, I guess the the starting point, and this is actually talked about in the report because it was mainly written for communicators, the, uh, the usual distinction there is between one-way communication and, and two-way communication. And one-way communication is uh, speaking at somebody. Uh, as uh, Professor Coleman said yesterday, this is the, the classic overlay of, oh, we have a new tool, we have an electronic tool, let's keep doing what we were doing, which is talking at people, but now let's do it electronically. Um, and, and <laughs> certainly that's, that's still uh, most of what you see out there. Uh, at its worst, it's actually propaganda. At its best, it's at least information. You're at least providing information. Uh, E-democracy, e uh, the agenda is very much uh, what you call uh, in, uh, two-way communications. And uh, again, in the communication theory, we'd call that two-way symmetric. It's, it's balanced. There's a... Uh, it's, uh, there's a, the power relationship is such that uh, people feel able to engage. There's a, a sharing of information, uh, and and that's what we're interested in. But but my research in this case was we have to start somewhere, and so I started at the at the simple level, which is how do we 
uh, how do government departments get the information out, uh, the ultimate agenda, of course, is then uh, understanding that, how can we build on that to build two-way communications and, uh, and a more democratic uh, process, or at least in terms of governance, a, a process um, that, is, that is better informed, uh, provides for more feedback and so on and so forth. Uh, so what, what did the research find? Uh, just, uh, overview is, uh, yes, of course, everybody has websites, we know that. Uh, in, when, when asked to select from a range of, of communications channels, yes, uh, most uh, government departments did report that it was their major channel, but there are some, uh, some refinements to that. Um, it's a major channel, but what comes out of the research and some of the follow-up interviews is seen as a... Uh, websites are seen as passive uh, depositories. They're where often there's uh, communication with, uh, with citizens or stakeholders and then afterwards that's where you put it, you, you stick it on the website. Um, and as we know, so often government uh, departmental websites are just filled with PDFs of documents that they've sent any, everybody. So I'm not sure that uh, that really is electronic communication, uh, to my mind, because you haven't actually used the, the, the medium to the extent to, uh, that we all know it can be. And so when, when, uh, when push comes to shove, direct, uh, things like direct mail and more traditional methods are, are, still, are still used. Uh, Postman Pat still gets, uh, still gets a run. Uh, who did I survey? Uh, basically, I set it out to about 215 communicators in government departments, statutory authorities, Victoria and New South Wales. I got about 60 responses and I did some, um, some follow-up interviews, uh, mostly different, some managers, uh, mostly professional communicators though, and again, all this is in, in the report, so I won't uh, go through the breakdown. So what did I actually ask about websites? First, I did ask, is it the, is it the major channel? And I also asked, is it, is it actually promoted? The reason I ask that is I've been talking to uh, Michael Matchett uh, from the Technology and Government Committee who many of the developers are expressing all this frustration that, uh, you know, good for them I suppose, you know, they've just been paid 100000 to deliver a website uh, on behalf of a, uh, a government agency or some, some multiple of that and uh, then it's not promoted. There's no, uh, there's no backup to actually draw people to it. Uh, so I did uh, also ask that question about you know, is it being promoted? Is the awareness being promoted? Um, on the first, yes, uh, websites are the major channel. On the second question, the interesting finding, I think, is uh, to me it, it looked like no real response at all, uh, which probably says to me that it, it's not really on the radar. This is not a question that people thought a lot about. Uh, very few people were prepared to um, strongly disagree or, or strongly agree. So. That, that to me is interesting that it's just not a question that's come up before. What channels do people use? Again, let's put the electronic means in, in the context of all the means available of reaching, reaching uh, citizens and uh, they'll, they'll use whatever it takes. Um, I suppose uh, we, we do have uh, at one end uh, information kiosks and so on, um, but generally they'll use publicity, they'll run events, use advertising, um, publicity is in fact a very high rate and uh, much preferred over advertising which is interesting in itself. Um, so we, let's, let's never forget about the media, uh, it's certainly favoured. But where, where the picture starts to change is I then narrowed it down and I said well okay you have all these channels but which would you actually choose if you had to get a message out, if you really had to make people aware of some particular initiative, and uh, as you'll see there, the, um, uh, by far the, the, the biggest was uh, direct mail, closely followed by publicity, uh, uh, generate some coverage in the local medium. Um, now, it, sometimes this, uh, it may well be that the content of that was drawing people back towards the website, but um, or other forms of electronic communication, but to be honest, I, I wouldn't put my money on it. Um, and that, that sort of got me thinking, and I, I've been doing a bit more, more reading on that. I was thinking, well, is this, there's two possible explanations for this fondness for direct mail. One is that it's, um, uh, it's the prejudice of the, of the people doing it, I think. All, certainly in terms of government business enterprises, uh, like, say, a water authority, it's got all of its customers on a database. 
it's very easy, for, and they're mailing them out to them uh, a bill every quarter, it's very easy for them to say, well, we'll, we'll put an extra um, a document in with the bill and, and we'll hope that they read it. Um, so certainly I think there is a bias to some extent in taking the easy option uh, for those organisations which, uh, which have it. But then I also thought, well, maybe this is what maybe there is some uh, message coming back from the people receiving the information and it so happened there is a, a study recently done admittedly by Australia Post uh, for our, which is of course our um, uh, national post office um, but it was done by independently by a market research firm and it certainly said that uh, we've not yet reached the stage where uh, consumers are saying I'd prefer to receive this electronically we're still uh, quite a way off that so so again, the, the phenomenon of the uh, of the direct mail usage, uh, I think, probably indicates a bit of bias uh, or a bit of uh, some lingering prejudice on the part on the part of both the communicators and also uh, uh, the receivers. So, uh, and as we all know, it's very hard to design a program relying solely on electronic means if you're trying to reach a, a mass. Uh, a mass audience. It's uh, it's relatively easy if if you want to run a policy debate or something where you're dealing with uh, peak bodies and experts and so on. You'll 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 find uh, that that lends itself to electronic means. But if you're actually trying to reach out and draw draw from a wider pool, well, uh, you've got more more dilemmas there. I asked a question. Uh, I am a consultant, so I've had a lot of interest in asking a question about what kind of consultants do you use. Um, but the relevance of this, I think, is, uh, as you'll see here, they, they do use consultants for a whole variety of things, um, uh, and obviously they, they need external providers uh, for most of their electronic materials. Very few government agencies um, have the in-house capability to completely uh, uh, develop a, web, a website, for instance, uh, or any kind of sophisticated program on their own. They might be able to run it once established, um, and they need people to, uh, and they use communicators to, to provide the material. But the actual development is, is usually done by external providers, and the relevance that I think of that is if if the agenda of this uh, of this conference, if you like, or of this uh, this type of gathering is about how do we promote or uh, change behaviours or open the eyes of of, uh, of government departments and agencies to a new way of relating to citizens, well, I would point to uh, the developers. Uh, I would uh, because they have a vested interest in in uh, presenting, saying to governments, look. They're, we have a whole we have whole new ways of doing this, and they can actually be uh, an agent of change, a um, uh, what, what are they uh, isomorphic for isomorphic behaviour. Uh, so maybe one of the things government should be thinking about is is actually set up some demonstration projects. I see um, uh, Cisco is a sponsor. Maybe they'd like to cough up for something like that because again, there's uh, this is where uh, the commercial driver could actually be harnessed. To the benefit of the uh, of the democratic agenda, and they're not uh, necessarily incompatible. <coughs> uh, although, of course, I would say that um, practical implications. Uh, again, I, men I mentioned uh, the potential resistance, and I think that needs would need to be explored with whatever initiative you're doing. Uh, um, I would, I think, it'd be very dangerous to always assume. Uh, that there would be wild enthusiasm for whatever the project is you're running. Uh, this is a, an age of information clutter and, uh, and there's old ways of doing things. So that, that would always, also always need to be examined. And secondly, um, uh, again, um, taking, taking the lead from um, uh, Professor Coleman yesterday, the, um, using the phrase like uh, e-governance or e-democracy, um, <coughs> Unless we we have firmly fixed in our heads what we mean by that, it, it could actually lead us to um, uh, limit limit our project by by designing it around the electronic interface, when uh, the actual objective is about governance and democracy, and the E in front of it is one means of getting there. Uh, so the point is, the electronic means need to be integrated with all the other means, uh, and. Um, 
uh, it's, it's part of a, of a suite of channels or, or forums and uh, I think probably that's practically where we're going but that, I think that's the link between the, um, uh, the concept and the practical applications. Um, in this sort of gathering of course I wouldn't uh, uh, dare to talk about theory per se um, but I, I, I would suggest that uh, I, to the extent that I've had a chance to go through some of the papers and, and uh, the abstracts for the, for the conference and, uh, and certainly some, some very fine work done, done there but uh, uh, perhaps as someone who reads widely rather than deeply uh, from a number of fields it always occurred to me that there's it seemed to me that there were some adjacent fields of, uh, of research that I think could actually add a lot to to the, uh, the emerging paradigm of, um, of e-governance and, uh, and certainly something like, as, you know, the whole basis of why I'm here is, you know, my belief is that the work done on stakeholder engagement by government and by, by, by indeed any organisation I think uh, could potentially flow quite valuably, valuably into uh, an e-governance agenda. But that's... Uh, that's pretty much it. As I say, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> it was done not purely for this purpose, but I, but I hope that, that some of uh, what I've delivered today is of, of relevance to the uh, uh, two people doing research and, and applying it in the field. Uh, there's the URL for the, uh, for the report, uh, and in the uh, true spirit of uh, interactivity, there's a feedback form in there. So if anyone wants to have a look at it and and uh, send that feedback. Uh, I'd be uh, be more than pleased uh, to receive it. Or if if you are a bit more traditional, I've even got a um, a uh, an email address, uh, phone number there. Actually, the phone number's wrong. Last, <laughs> um, uh, but at least an email address. Uh, I understand we're taking the questions at the end, so I'll leave that there and uh, pass over to Melissa. Thanks, Pat. Remember to, to note down your questions so you're, you uh, uh, are prepared at the uh, question session at the end. Uh, the next uh, speaker on the, the program is actually Daniel Payers. Uh, he is from the University of Melbourne, from the Department of Geomatics, uh, which is a new term on me. And perhaps he might explain that to me. So, uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Pat. Right. Um, good afternoon. Like um, Pat says, I'm from the Department of Geomatics. I'm just going to change my presentation here. And today I'm going to present um, the research that you are, we are developing in the Department of Geomatics. Um, although it's not uh, completely related to the political science component of the conference that we are attending, it has a main objective of, of being uh, a tool for e-governance. And um, I will try to emphasize in that aspect in this presentation. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to initially explain a bit uh, cost-benefit analysis, that is a very common um, methodology to evaluate projects and, and government policies. Then I'm going to link that to uh, my computer system that is called Discuss, and that's the e-governance tool. And finally, I'm going to present um, my, some of the results that we have found and some of the methodology that we have been creating. So let's start talking about cost-benefit analysis. And to talk about cost-benefit analysis, let me show you all this map about uh, Lake McCoon and, and the area of North Victoria. In this map, we can see the different uh, water systems that are, are located in North Victoria. And at the moment, there is a case uh, for policy making in this area where the um, government of Victoria is analyzing different possibilities to save water. One of the alternatives for that is Lake McCoon. So. The option for Lake Macon is either to convert it back to a slum or a wetland or to change its operational 
uh, area. Some of you might have heard about this case uh, before. So, to evaluate that, the Victorian government developed a case, um, sorry, a cost-benefit analysis. So, basically, a cost-benefit analysis is a methodology where you try to convert all the impacts um, into a monetary value. So, you try to determine, determine those areas where are going to be impacted and convert those values to money. Uh, the, here in the screen we can see uh, those, like a typical result for a cost-benefit analysis. At the top we, ha we have the, um, the option that we are evaluating, that in this case is option one, and we can calculate the total uh, quantity of benefits that for this option is this value, 78 million, and then we also can calculate the total quantity of cost, that is 17.5 seven, sorry, uh, millions, and with these we calculate an indicator for decision making, that is the net, be net present value. With this indicator, governments take decision. So we can summarize that for each of the options we can generate an indicator for decision making, and the bigger the indicator, according to the methodology, and this is a very important part, the best the option is for um, the community or for the society. So if in this case we have these two results, and this is just an example, uh, we will choose option one, because option one has a net present value bigger than option two. This methodology, cost-benefit analysis, is the start point of my research. There are many questions that cost-benefit analysis cannot, cannot answer, and there are, there are what regions are the beneficiaries or who is going to be affected? Those spatial or map results cannot be explained by cost benefit uh, by itself. And wh why we want to answer those spatial components of the cost benefit analysis? Well, probably to better understand the effects of the project because we get a number but we don't know where that effect occurs. Also to allow public participation. People can understand better the results if we give them both figures and maps. And finally, to generate new indicators for decision making. For example, we can calculate not only the net present value for the society, but for, uh, per population, for example, or as a rate or for some parameter. So, in summary, my research problem is the lack of a spatial dimension in cost-benefit analysis limits the ability to make policy decisions. And in order to approach this problem, our research objective is to develop a method and associated tools, this is the e-governance tool that we are proposing, to incorporate a spatial dimension into the, into the policy-making process. So, what is DISCUSS that is the tool that we are proposing? Well, DISCUSS is a software uh, that its analysis follows cost-benefit analysis. That means that we keep traditional cost-benefit analysis in the, in the same way that it is currently applied, and we get all the results after that is uh, achieved. We also um, approach the system as a not technocratic. That means it, it is not a system that its results are based on technical procedures. It's more based in the experience or the different opinions from the stakeholders. And finally, the, the main objective is to identify effects and regions where discrepancy between stakeholders exists. So we want to see in a spatial form or in a map form well, where this discrepancy occurs. So this is a screenshot of the system. And something that we, uh, we would like to emphasize in this uh, part of my presentation is that our system has many ways to be delivered. It, will, it could be delivered by internet or it could be delivered in a um, PC or in a workshop environment. So the methodology to deliver 
the tool, it depends on the different application or the case. We are developing the case study to be develop, delivered in a workshop environment, but it could be easily converted to a uh, Java environment and be able to be uh, presented over the internet. And also, I should mention that this case study is uh, a computer software based on a um, uh, geographic information system, or GIS. That's the um, software that is giving the capability to discuss, to do uh, spatial calculations. So, let's go back to that table that we saw before, where we have the results from the cost-benefit analysis. So, the idea is that these numbers, I mean, if we assume that we are only dealing with this line, for example, one of these lines, one of those benefits, we can have a stakeholder showing us what he thinks is going to be the areas that will be affected by this effect or project, and we, which areas will not be affected. And if we have two stakeholders with different results, and this is result, result for stakeholder two, we can get a map of the areas where disagreement between stakeholders exists. And this is the main output of our system. We are providing to the community and to the government the areas where people disagree about the different effects of the policy that he has been analyzed. How we do that? Let's make a zoom of a map, one of, of, one of those maps that we're generating. And if you see we're modeling the space as, um, as a block or cell. We call this type of modeling raster modeling. Why we do that is because each cell or each square contains a number. So if we uh, go to this figure, and this figure is shown also in the paper that we are presenting in this conference, you can see that for each cell we have a value, and that value represents the cost or benefit that the stakeholder is analyzing to that particular area. With this um, form of representing the space, or raster form, we could also model polygons. As you can see, we can make an approximation of a polygon. So let's focus on a one cell. That initial cell on the corner that is zero, if I add it to the second cell that is minus four representing a cost, I end for that cell, I'm sorry, go back to that, I end with a value of minus four. And if I can do exactly the same task for each of those, I will get a different value. So the net value for the region is represented in here. As you can see, different areas are located in the map as a net value. This is what we call a spatial disaggregation of costs and benefits. So how we do that? Well, we use experience for the, from the stakeholders. We don't have nothing hidden behind or a technical procedure hidden behind. Everything that is presented in the system is according to the experience of the stakeholders. So the first method that the stakeholders have to disaggregate is to use the technical information available for the project. So let's suppose that we have again our table for cost-benefit analysis and we have a value of um, 57.1 million of benefits in water savings. For that value, we have a model that will deliver it to the government representing the area that will be benefited by that result. The stakeholder individually can accept it or reject that value. So, in this case, the stakeholder could say, okay, I'm agree with that representation or not. What happens if the necessary information is not available or the stakeholder do not agree with the methodology? Well, we can move to the second method that we are proposing. That is uh, um, using entities. And we're, gonna, we're going to explain that in this, uh, with this effect. Saving in cost of water treatment in Shepparton, 1.3 million. So if we have that, the stakeholder, what can do is assign it directly 
to the polygon that represents Shepparton. This is the Shepparton local government area. So it's assigning that benefit, 1.3 million, to the Shepparton area. But again, we can cover this for individual stakeholder, but it might be again a problem for, for a stakeholder that a polygon, it could be the local government area, the other boundaries, electoral boundaries, so, so on, cannot represent what he thinks is going to be the effect. So we move to our third method, and that method is called expert fuzzy disaggregation, fuzzy disaggregation. And I'm going to stop here in the line that I'm following to explain a bit more about cost, about um, fossil logic. Fossil logic is a methodology that we have decided to adopt because um, compared to traditional logic, it is a logic that permits more interaction with the human mind, to give it a name, and at the same time, and this is something that we consider very important, you can get mathematical results. So, um, in the next slide, I'm going to run an example of how fossil logic works in a similar case of our situation. And then, I'm going to move it to our system. So, let's imagine that we have a case. We are the managers of a company, and we need to buy new computers to our staff. I need to go to the store and get a crisp number. I need to go there and say, well, I need a big computer hard disk for my staff. How big it should be? That's a big question. So I call two experts and say to them, okay, how big should it be? And those experts might have some problems to decide how big it is because maybe um, the computer size depends on the different task. But I need one result. So I changed the question, and that's when I'm using fossil logic. I asked my, my expert where they think is an area that is, um, or how big it, sh it should be uh, good for my staff, the, the side of the computer, and what area should not be. So I get an answer for my expert one that says that no less than 10, and this is, let's assume is gigabytes, no less than 10 gigabytes, and it's good to have a hard, disk, a hard disk between 30 and 60, 60, and no more than 70. So this expert is giving us the input using fossil logic. He's saying, I think it's good in here, I think it's bad in there, but I'm not sure about the other area. That's the fuzzy areas. Let's see, let's see that in a graph. The, the expert said, I know there is bad less than 10, good between 30 and 70, and over 70 is a waste. So, if I take from this um, graph, I can see two areas. So, this area in here shows us where the expert is sure that it's good. These areas also represent the same value. She is sure, or she is sure, that this is not um, good but he has a fuzzy decision about these areas. That's why we need fuzzy logic. He's not sure about those things. We can have exactly the same thing for expert two and get something that we call the decision environment. And that decision environment can tell us uh, what is the different opinion about uh, the case that we are analyzing in this in this situation, example is the hard disk of a computer that we are analyzing. So, having that, I can take that result that is fuzzy, because there are areas of fuzziness in here, and using that, I can calculate a crisp number to go to the store and buy my computer. How I do that? Using different methods of the simplification. One of those is um, center of gravity. So I can calculate the center of gravity of this shape and with that get a value and go to the store and buy my computers. So let's go back to my case study and let's go back to, to my research and we are applying exactly the same in Discuss the software. 
So we have loss of net uh, in economic value of recreational activities, 4.3. Very ambiguous, maybe fuzzy areas might be influenced because of this. So how we process this data? Well, we present to the stakeholders a map and ask them to show us polygons that they think uh, represent areas where definitely an impact will occur. So using drawing tools, very simple drawing tools, they can draw areas where they think definitely an impact will occur. With that, we ask then our expert or stakeholder to draw us areas where he or she thinks impact will not occur because of this um, effect. So we get two sets of polygons. These areas for the stakeholders and the shape of those depends completely on what he wants to express. There is no limitation with the, with the political boundaries or any other boundaries and represent how he sees the situations. But in this, we have some fuzzy areas in here where the stakeholder is not 100% sure of the effect. Let's zoom in to analyze how this CAS will process this data. And I won't get in much detail here because we're moving to the area of geomatics, that is the processing of map or spatial uh, information. But basically, um, considering, uh, considering that we have um, um, representing the space of a cell, each cell has a distance to a, a polygon that is with no effect or a, and a polygon that is with effect. So for each cell, I can calculate something that we call fuzzy numbers, but in, in where this distance represents the distance to a polygon where there is no effect, and this distance represents the uh, distance to a polygon with effect. And in this case, it will get this result for that specific cell. Each cell is calculated um, individually. And having each cell calculated, we can join them together in the same way that we did with the example uh, shown before, and generate one spatial or general decision um, environment. And with that, calculate one value for each cell using those uh, diffusification methods. Obviously, there's a lot of mathematics behind, but the advantage of geographic information systems and the new computer systems is the, the complete operational operation for an area like Victoria, it will take approximately 15 seconds. So it's something that you can do in a workshop environment and, and at the same time have interaction with the result that you get. And finally, this, and this was exactly this, the slide that I showed before, this is the main objective. Calculating those things using fast logic, we can have areas where the, there is disagreement between stakeholders and areas where there is agreement. So we think that our tool contributes to the decision process by helping the decision makers to focus on where the discrepancy between stakeholders exists and then focus the discussion in those points. And the important thing is that you are allowing with this CAS um, a complete availability to speak for the stakeholders so they can really express their opinion about the different uh, impacts or effects that a project might have. And finally, as I mentioned, the, this course could be run in a different environment, could be as a workshop environment, or could be put on the web, so you can you get your inputs through a web-based application. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think I now know what geomatics is, which is uh, uh, an education at a conference, which is a wonderful thing. Um, the, the next speaker is uh, um, uh, Melissa 
Connolly Tyler, and she's also from the University of Melbourne, and uh, she is works in international conflict resolution, and her topic is Lessons for E-Government Online Dispute Resolution. So thank you very much, Melissa. If I can start by saying I'm very pleased to be part of this event. I imagine for most of you my topic today, online dispute resolution, wasn't something you were necessarily expecting to talk about. You uh, might not have expected to hear someone from the International Conflict Resolution Centre at a conference like this. But my, my topic here today is explaining why I think it is that an area such as online dispute resolution is of great relevance to anyone who is dealing with e-government or e-governance initiatives. Okay. So basically I'm, I'm going to take three parts. I see online dispute resolution as a key tool for e-governance. Um, my argument is that online dispute resolution offers a range of tools for resolving disputes online. So I'll be talking about the current state of online dispute resolution, what it is. That it's being increasingly adopted in institutional contexts such as courts, tribunals, other government and semi-government bodies and I'll be talking about the demonstrated demand there is there. And that because of this, this emerging area is something that those interested in governance and government online should be looking at. Okay, but let's start. What am I talking about when I'm talking about online dispute resolution? So, online dispute resolution is a dispute resolution process which is assisted by technology, um, especially the internet. So, dispute resolution processes can be facilitative ones, things like mediation, which I imagine most of you are aware of, conciliation, facilitated negotiation, etc. Advisory processes, things like case appraisal, early neutral evaluation, mock trial, etc. And determinative processes adjudication, arbitration. And these are provided obviously by a range of institutions. At the moment, mostly those are provided face-to-face, -face, sometimes by phone, but mostly face-to-face. -face. Um, so this area of assisting those dispute resolution processes by technology is an interesting one. And I should say right off the bat, when I'm talking about online dispute resolution, I mean using online technologies for dispute resolution. The disputes themselves can come from many, many different areas. They don't have to be relating to online communication. They can be family disputes, commercial disputes, etc. And for those of you that are interested, uh, the research uh, in the methodology, I suppose, the research we've conducted here was for the Department of Justice, Victoria, and we did a three-part project. We looked at the state of online dispute resolution, and we did what at this point is the most comprehensive look at what is the state of online dispute resolution. Uh, we then did a needs assessment, which, as far as we know, is the first time this has been tried, which is asking citizens and government agencies within Victoria what their needs and demand for online dispute resolution is. And then finally, we came up with a feasibility report. So I'll be reporting on those today. Okay. So starting with the current state of online dispute resolution. What is this? How is it working? Okay, well, firstly, it's new. It only started in around 96, and the first drivers were very much uh, people who saw this as a bit of a hobby. You know, someone had an interest in dispute resolution, they knew something about computers, they thought they'd try and put the two together. Uh, we then moved into a phase where uh, foundations that are interested in um, you know, funding new technology, etc., started to fund pilot projects, and we moved into a more experimental phase. Then we get into a more entrepreneurial phase, um, great dot-com boom, etc. Quite a few people thought, well, there's lots of transactions going on on the internet. Many transactions equals disputes. Therefore, there should be a business opportunity in setting up a dispute resolution system that is provided over the internet. And um, many of those haven't survived, but uh, that was certainly one of the, the drivers for growth for a while. I'd say where we're at at the moment is what I'm calling more institutional phase, where government agencies, courts, you know, 
more official institutions which provide dispute resolution services in the real world are also thinking about how they can extend their services through the use of technology. Okay. And broadly, I'd say, I'd say there are three main drivers for this. There's the e-commerce side, that when you are buying and selling things um, which may be small value disputes, um, are possibly cross-border, you don't really have any meaningful alternative than coming up with some online dispute resolution. So you're not going to make a claim in a court in Oregon because somebody sold you something you didn't think like on eBay. You're going to have to come up with some way of resolving this. Um, the bit that I uh, said so the second driver, the one that makes it most attractive to government and other uh, you know, informal institutions, is access to justice issues. That for some people, the current dispute resolution systems we have are actually not that accessible. So if you live in a rural and regional area, you'd be aware of that. Um, you know, if you're uh, confined, imprisoned, if you have um, various disabilities that make the technology um, easier to use than, for example, face-to-face -face communication, then that's all relevant. And one for example in family disputes, if you, there might be good reasons you don't want to be in the same room as the other person, so thinking about how you can use communication, communications technology to resolve that dispute can be good. And the third driver I put up there, I suppose, is just the, the natural human curiosity. Um, People are interested, uh, a lot of people are interested in how you can resolve disputes better. You can resolve them without uh, bloodshed, violence, too many raised voices, etc. So ways to resolve disputes more effectively, more efficiently are of interest. And uh, many people saw that new technologies might offer that to them. Now in terms of what's out there, um, we were very surprised to find 76 sites. As I say, no one had actually done this before to go and try and find all the online dispute resolution sites. And we thought, uh, given that you know, we're talking from, uh, from 96 as the absolute first site, that's actually not too bad. Most are North American, US and Canadian, but uh, Europe is catching up and there are some excellent sites in Singapore, um, one of which I'll show you. What we found is that there are a range of ADR processes. Uh, so you have mediation and arbitration as being the most offered processes online. Not surprisingly, those are the ones that are most used offline indeed. But you can see a lot of other things as well. You can see case appraisal, you can see mini trials, all sorts of things. And uh, the technology has created some new ones that don't really exist, have an analogue in um, the you know, non-online world. So uh, things like blind bidding systems, which I'll tell you about a little bit, where you have just an automated program that helps the parties come up with bids, get closer, and then split the difference and settle a matter. Okay? So not something you do as a real live face-to-face -face mediator, but something the technology can help you do. Okay. Now, as I said, they, you, they deal with both online and offline disputes. I think early on there was an idea that this would only really be relevant to disputes that had anything to do with an online community or an online transaction, and that just hasn't turned out to be the, the case. One of the earliest systems was dealing with family disputes and found that was very popular. Um, and some of the other systems that have tried to deal only with online disputes have found people have wanted to use them for, for, uh, for offline disputes as well. Um, mostly the technology used is a secure web page. Uh, and this is, this is one of the issues I think people still have with online dispute resolution. They think it's all via email, therefore it's insecure, therefore how could I possibly participate? This is not the case. Um, it is definitely through secure web pages. So you, know, you have the same level of security you have in, say, walking into a mediation room or a pre-trial conference where it is possible the other party will try to you know, record you with something in their pocket. but. Clearly, that's against the rules, and it is, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a manager, matter of risk management more than anything else. Now, one of, I suppose, the disappointing things for us in a way was uh, looking at the, the languages involved, um, and mostly, uh, it's, I think it's 53 of the 76 sites are in English, and as yet, there's very few multilingual sites. Uh, and in terms of caseload, um, we've, some of the sites have just dealt with one dispute which is a bit sad for them. But the more successful site, um, which I'll show you, has now gone over that 400,000 figure. The latest I said, heard was 800,000. So that is going very well indeed. And the settlement rates achieved are pretty much broadly the same as for 
non-online dispute resolution techniques. So nothing particularly different there. Now if I could just, I think the best way to have an idea of what I'm talking about with online dispute resolution is actually showing you some of the sites. And I'd encourage anyone who's interested, go and visit some of these. Um, the one I want to show you first is Square Trade, and that's the one that, as I say, has now settled over 800,000 disputes. Um, it's a private venture. It's one of the few of the um, entrepreneurial phase that you know, did survive and prosper. Uh, and the major reason it's done that is its partnership with eBay. So if you, I don't know how many of you have ever participated in the eBay community, but um, if you have, you'd know that you can buy and sell. You have... Um, you have a web seal, um, you can, sorry, you can use a web seal, and uh, whenever you participate in the eBay market, you can get feedback on you from the person that you transacted with. So there's a real built-in incentive in the eBay system to not have disputes with people, because if they have a dispute with you, they'll put really negative feedback, your rating will go down, and you will find it hard to buy or sell in that marketplace again. So that's really the... The, the carrot and stick of getting involved in dispute resolution online is that um, you've got you've got something you want to get off off your record. Um, now, interestingly, Square Trade has now moved on to uh, offline disputes as well. It's got a partnership with the California Association of Realtors, dealing with you know as real world as you can get buying and selling houses, um, which is interesting. Now, the way Square Trade works is it has a three part process. First of all, it uh, guides you through a, um, an induction process where you say what the dispute is, um, what the problem is as you see it, what you'd like a possible resolution to, to be. And it does that in a very structured way. So it's not just people venting, putting flaming emails out there. It's you know, exactly what happened. Would you accept any of their following as, you know, as a solution? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, what they find is that the, the process they have there, which I, I'd call facilitate negotiation, direct negotiation between the parties, that's so successful that over 85% of cases settle at that point. They don't need any more intervention. So in fact, at that point, there's no human intervention. It's an automated one where the parties are given a particularly structured platform in which they can carry on their own negotiation. If that doesn't work, so for 15%, they then go on to mediation, and that's done with real human mediators. There's a number of hundred of them who are on the, um, on the Square Trade books. They're around the world. Some of them are in Australia. Uh, and, yes, they, they then provide a, a mediation over um, sort of bulletin board type technology. If that doesn't work, the, the final um, part of the process is for the mediator to give an advice. So to say, okay, you don't, two don't think you can solve it, but here's what I would do if I were in your situation. Okay. Now, the second one I want to talk about is uh, from the UK. It's called the Claim Room or the Mediation Room. Um, and they're interesting because they deal mainly with offline commercial disputes. So they work basically with law firms. Um, most, of their, most of their cases would be one where there are parties and they are represented. Um, and what it offers are um, mediation and facilitation, but also um, some automated negotiation. Now, what, what's interesting, I suppose, is the way it so closely simulates the sort of dispute resolution environment that you see in traditional face-to-face -face mediations. So it has a number of rooms. It has the room where all of the parties can see the documents. It then has the room where one party can talk to its lawyer, the other room where one party can talk to its lawyer, the room where you know, the mediator can talk to them, and the room where the mediator can make its own, his or her own notes um, and keep copies of documents. So it's a very intuitive system for people who've worked in dispute resolution as mediators. Next one is a uh, dispute manager, which is a Singaporean example. Um, and certainly it's by far the most sophisticated one in the region. The, the other Singaporean one, EADR, uh, is also very good. Um, this one was launched by, um, launched by the Ministry of Law uh, Singapore Mediation Centre. Um, EADR is a subordinate course initiative, so it's, a, it's basically a small claims tribunal one. And they're interesting, I suppose, in the, the way they um, have just implemented this 
and incorporated this into ordinary practice. So when I go to the quasi-government Singapore Mediation Centre, I can have a face-to-face -face mediation or I can have one online. When I go to the Small Claims Tribunal, in their case the subordinate courts, I can file my case through online and have it dealt with online or I can do it the traditional way. Um, the processes that dispute manager offers, it has mediation and case appraisal. Um, one that's a little bit different, I haven't talked about yet, it has, is called blind bidding. And uh, that's what I was saying, it's an automated system where where parties wish to settle a matter but the only issue for them is um, how much they're going to settle it for, you can get them to put confidential bids in, I'll give you so much, I, won't accept, I want so much, I'll give you so much, I want so much. And when the computer get, when the bids get close enough, according to preset parameters, usually something like 15% apart, the computer splits it down the middle and settles it. And if um, any of you have ever been involved in litigation where uh, you spent six months trying to decide on the last couple of thousand dollars, you'll know why that sort of thing is relevant. My last one is an Australian example, um, and I just wanted to talk briefly about New South Wales retail tenancies. Um, it's interesting because it's happening here, I suppose. Um, it doesn't offer full mediation or dispute resolution online. What it does instead is lets you do all the admin that goes around that. So you can lodge a claim, you can pay fees, you can track progress online, um, and you can communicate as one party with the, with the mediator or case officer, but you can't communicate with the other party. So it shows that you don't have to do the whole thing online to make use of some of the technologies, that you can say there are parts of this dispute resolution process that we wish to use technology, information technology for, and that will be useful. And I won't go through these, but I've got a list of some of the other examples. Ecodea is um, the European Union's consumer dispute site. Uh, Smart Settles and Negotiation Support Package. Um, iCourthouse is a mock trial uh, thing, which you can put your documents before you put them to a real court, and you can have volunteer jurors from around the world give their judgments. So it shows there are some interesting things out there. And Michigan Cyber Court is um, not yet operational, but it's an attempt to have uh, an online court within the Michigan system. Um, Civil Tribunal shows that it's possible in a developed country context. So that's my first part, is saying online ADR is happening. Um, and there are a lot of tools out there for people who are interested in resolving disputes online. Second thing I wanted to talk about is really institutional interest in online ADR, how this is relevant to e-governance and government. Okay, and I mean, probably this is well known to, to most of you here, but in Victoria there is a real commitment to online services and coming directly from that, uh, the International Conflict Resolution Centre was asked to do some research into online dispute resolution, uh, particularly looking at what it could do for access to justice. It seemed a logical next step from a lot of the services already being provided online. Okay, and what we did there is we talked to both potential users of online dispute resolution and we talked to some agencies, government agencies that might be providing that service. And we certainly aim for a broad cross section. So we um, gathered data from uh, people currently using Victorian government dispute resolution services, so all people who called in a certain period, etc. And that meant we got people who'd never used computers versus people who were daily users. So we had a, a lot of range there. Um, and generally we were very pleased with the range, as you can see. In terms of the processes, we had everything from consumer complaints to more small claims to um, you know, licensing small business disputes, etc. And we were really asking, do you see online dispute resolution as potentially being applicable in the context of the dispute resolution you already do? When we looked at users, what we found was a very surprising, I think quite extraordinary level of public interest in online dispute resolution. We found um, consistently in surveys and focus groups, etc., that over 70% of people would consider using online dispute resolution if they had dispute. We gave them a range of different sorts of disputes, everything from a plumbing dispute to you know, other disputes and asked them how they deal with it. Um, not surprisingly, we found that people who were, you know, more who used the internet more often and people who used it for transactions such as banking, etc., were more likely to think this was useful and there was definitely a small group who just didn't like online communication, as you would expect. 
and the reasoning behind it is probably, again, pretty clear. Cost, speed, convenience were the big things. Um, I think what you, you don't want to underestimate is that there is often a lot of dissatisfaction um, out there with some of the ways that government currently provides some of its services. Uh, so people who had a bad experience or who were looking for alternatives were much more likely to be interested in looking at online dispute resolution. When we looked at agencies, um, again I think we were surprised by how consistently positive the response was. Um, generally those agencies all said they can see the benefits of online dispute resolution, that they saw it adding to their existing services. Now, they did think it had weaknesses. They didn't think it was for every one of the disputes they dealt with, and that was, that was fine. It was seen as really just one tool. What came through very clearly is just this sense that um, it's probably inevitable, that just as we had to get used to all sorts of other technologies, which were probably a bit inconvenient to introduce when they first came up, we're probably going to have to do the same here. It'll require cultural change. It probably should be introduced as a pilot. We've got to integrate it with existing systems, but we accept that it really is going to happen and that that's how things are going. Okay, so in terms of implications for e-government, what does this mean? My argument is that dispute resolution is essentially a governance function whether you're talking about government services online or governance of electronic communities, you just have to accept that, uh, that disputes are something that go with people, with citizens, you know, with, with almost any area of human activity, and that providing some mechanisms for people to resolve those disputes is just a, a key function for, for government and governance. Online dispute resolution is a rapidly developing area. As I say, it's only been going since 96 and we've already got 76 different sites. And it offers a number of tools. It offers things for individual disputes, for more multi-party disputes, for offline, online disputes. It can deal with you know, a whole range, commercial, e-commerce, family, all sorts of areas. So seeing that there's a lot in the toolbox there in terms of dispute resolution techniques coming from ODR. And the research we did looking at both citizen demand and agency demand suggests that online dispute resolution will really increasingly be adopted by, by government institutions. So I'd expect to see a lot more sites like the Retail Tenancy Unit of New South Wales one in the, and in the longer term I'd expect that we'd be seeing um, whole mediations, whole conciliations, etc. done online. So where to for online dispute resolution? Well, there's significant interest in ODR worldwide um, and particularly looking at things like digital divide. Uh, we're very lucky here in Melbourne that um, the third UN forum on online dispute resolution is going to be held here in July. So I'd encourage anyone who found this interesting to come. It's, it's a free event, it's a UN event, so it has to be free, but numbers are limited, so do get in. And you should all have a copy of the registration form for that event in your packs, so do get back. And I suppose um, you know, what I, I'd, uh, I'd like to suggest, oh, and sorry, I didn't mention, we, we do have a one-day course on online dispute resolution as well, if you want to learn more there. But uh, what I see is very valuable is there being a lot more dialogue between the people who are doing online dispute resolution and people who are doing e-governance. And I think to date there actually hasn't been very much. Um, people doing e-governance have, have looked at you know, participatory democracy and all sorts of very interesting things there and probably online dispute resolution hasn't really understood that very well and vice versa. So I hope today is a bit of a start on that in uh, exposing you to this area and uh, look forward to people's questions. Great. I'd like to thank all our speakers. I think I think we've had a, a really uh, a very interesting session looking at some uh, on the ground or in cyberspace uh, reality of uh, e-government. Uh, so I'll open it up for questions, and what I will do. Um, because the webcam is, I shall restate your question, then I'll ask whoever it's addressed to to come up and speak from the podium. So, any questions at this stage? Yes, here. Uh, 
Okay, the, uh, the question is how important is the technical sophistication of the software for the ODR process, if you like to come up. I, I suspect you probably don't need much, actually, um, for the majority of disputes. Uh, people, if anyone here has ever had the misfortune to be acting in a dispute resolution role, you can realise that sometimes a lot of parties are actually very, very close to being wanting to resolve the dispute, but just don't have any tools to get there. And it can be as simple as you give them a room and you say a few nice words and they get a glass of water each and, you know, it's not in a, in a way rocket science. Um, you can be pretty sure that for a large proportion of cases, giving them a fairly minimal amount of support will help them over the line. Now, for a proportion of cases, it's much harder than that. And that's where I think the more sophisticated tools come in. But uh, certainly, I think you, can, you could trial some quite simple tools very easily and you would get pretty good success rates without it being too complex. For, for uh, are there any specific training needs for people using the technology? Do, do you mean the you know, the neutrals in the middle or the parties? Mm. It probably again depends on the systems. Um, something like uh, Square Trade? No, not at all. It's web-based. It's very simple. You fill in a form. Um, it uses bulletin board technology, which you can be pretty sure that anyone using eBay feels quite comfortable with. So it's relatively intuitive, no, no special training needed. On the other extreme, something like Smart Settle, which is a negotiation and support system, which is um, very analytical. It gets both sides to, uh, to rate their preferences on a number of things. So it probably has a, a bit of a uh, bit in common with Daniel's um, presentation. Uh, so people rate their preferences, then they the computer will tell you whether you can get a better option than the one you've got, so without revealing to each other. Uh, something like that, you need 40 hours training to really understand it. So it's on the other extreme. But I would have thought that the very mass market ones, no, no particular issue. Um, there are some issues for the neutrals, uh, and they have to learn quite a few new things, which is one of the reasons why I think online dispute resolution so far has been more popular among parties and consumers than it has been among the dispute resolution profession. Um, just a simple one, if you're already very expert in doing face-to-face -face mediations and you're going to have to learn how to do it online and you're going to have to learn new techniques, how do I reframe, how do I do rituals, how do I, you know, how do I control some of the, the emotions involved online, it's new, it's a little bit threatening. But um, I, I think for a lot of a lot of disputants, it's actually quite liberating to be able to, to use this technology and they find it easier to use than the sort of court-type institutions that we offer for dispute resolution, which in themselves are pretty intimidating. Any other questions? Daniel, which is... Just to summarise, the question is about the benefits and uh, how people will respond to being identified as benefits and disbenefits and, and whether it will actually, I suppose, lead to resolution. It, it, it might lead to more, uh, as the suggestion goes, Machiavellian politics. And perhaps if I might just add a little bit more onto that question that struck me when I was looking at it, that of course you could use these maps to map uh, party political preferences and so you would be able to see whether this was going to appeal to uh, a Labour or a Liberal constituency and then what kind of heat it would give to uh, 
uh, various governments and, and, and it struck me perhaps as a cynical political scientist that uh, uh, that might be a problem although of course it could be turned on its head and, and governments could say we are doing this despite the fact that we think it's going to go against our usual constituencies but I'd, I'd be interested to know what Daniel had to say about this. Uh, well thanks for the question thanks Pat for that comment well, it's exactly like that, like you just mentioned, and something that you can do with the software is crossing that interactions from the stakeholder with a political boundary or electoral boundary or something like that. And the software is intent to do that, and it's intent to bring those people that might be against, against the project by giving them tools to speak why they are against. So it's exactly intent to do that, to, to bring those different in table and put it on and try to analyze where are the differences occurring. What is happening now in the process is that the people oppose the decision, but they don't have the tool to oppose it. So what they could do, for example, is opposing the technical aspect. Although you invest $2 million in a study like in Make Macon, but people, the only tool that they have is saying, well, it's not a good study, and they try to find another technician saying something different and so on. So we want to move forward and say, okay, if we have difference, let's put it on the table, let's see it in the map, and then if we need to cross it over with a political boundary, we will do it and focus if it's a problem in a political boundary, we move on to that area. But it's, it's in that aspect that exactly what we want to encourage is to have that kind of this um, transparent uh, discussion in, in, in the process. Uh, yeah, the question is um, if, it's, uh, if it's important not only to explicify for the stakeholders not only the area but the reason why this area is considered with an impact or not. Definitely yes, and that's also part of the system. Probably those justification for those things uh, are not uh, very clear in the cases where you apply the technology or, um, over the internet, for example or in one by one basis. However, if you do it in a workshop environment, and that's why, why it's mainly designed, you expect them to justify why they are putting in that, that way. And just to, just to put a polygon surrounding some specific areas or some specific uh, features of the, of the terrain, like a road or a town or so on, I think give you a, lo give you a lot of uh, reasons why that uh, person is trying to do that, but definitely in a workshop environment, it is um, part of the system is to give reasons why you are putting that. And moreover, with the system where you are filling the polygon, the whole room is seeing you the way you are you are you are uh, drawing your polygon. So you 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 can get a direct question: why you are doing that and not there, or why is your emphasis in this is not an impact or yes. So in that sense, we expect that in a workshop environment, we could cover that, that definitely, as you mentioned, is a very important aspect of the system. Sounds like you're speaking from experience, Bob. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the question, to, to paraphrase, is uh, how effective can the model be in differentiating between the motivations and ambitions of stakeholders, and in particular the, the, uh, uh, the, the intractable uh, stakeholder, perhaps? 
thank you for the question, Bob. It's an excellent question and it's an excellent point to consider. We definitely found very interesting to bring our research to this forum because we have um, we are giving ex excellent feedback to improve our system. In that sense, we have we got a similar comment from uh, for our reviewers of our paper, and now we are working in a system that cluster the different perception from the stakeholder. So the system is receiving the different perceptions and using cluster technologies is trying to say, okay, looks like these seven people think in a similar way, these other three thinks in a different way, and we have two or three that are completely out of order. We could do that with the state a standard deviation with the results, and that's something we're doing now, but we're improving the system trying to, uh, to bring some artificial intelligence um, procedures to try to cluster that in different groups. So at the end, and that's the next step of our research after these comments are, and a comment like you just mentioned, we will try to show that the government, not only the areas where different occur, but areas where different between groups occur. And that's definitely something that in practical, um, it might be more beneficial for the, for the, for the government. In that case, I'd, I'd uh, just like to, to you to join me in thanking again our three excellent speakers this, this afternoon, and uh, um, thank you for your uh, perceptive questions too.